Hello, everyone. I am Claire Booth Luce, and I'm here today to tell you my story. Was a Ridgefield resident, 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. Lived Limestone and Great Hill Road. Oh, a hundred of the most beautiful acres. We called it Sugar Hill. I lived there with my famous husband, Henry Luce. We had a 22-room mansion. Oh, did I love that place. Now, what I remember most about Ridgefield to St. Mary's, I was a very devout Catholic and spent a lot of time at St. Mary's. Well, really, who was I? I was many different things. Um, I was a child actress. I was a playwright, a screenwriter, a journalist, an essayist, an international correspondent, a war correspondent. I was the editor of women's magazines. For two sessions, I was in Congress, the United States Congress. I was an ambassador to many different countries. I was an artist, diplomat. I was a philanthropist and I was for women's rights. Now, I had a lot of accomplishments, but my beginning, I think you're gonna be very surprised at my beginning. Well, my mother and father, never married. Uh, my father loved to play the violin. He wasn't that good at it. And he was a traveling salesman and he never made much money. And when I was eight years old, he took off and I never saw him again. My mother was a chorus girl, had a hard time bringing me up, not enough money. Did have connections. I was very precocious, very cute, very smart. So she got me into the theater. Mary Pickens, I was her understudy. Never made it on stage. Did have small roles on Broadway when I was very young. Went to all Catholic schools, graduated from the castle in Terrytown. End of my education. Absolutely no college experience at all. And my mother gave me a rule, some advice, marry a millionaire. Well, I didn't only marry one millionaire, I married two millionaires. The first one, I was only 20 years old. He was 26 years older than I. It certainly didn't work, except, oh my goodness, I had the most beautiful daughter, Anna, at age 20. She died in a car accident. I never got over it. I built a chapel for her later in life. Well, anyway, my second millionaire was Henry Luce, and I had to be Claire Booth Luce because there was an actress named Claire Luce. Now, this man, oh my goodness, he was the publisher time, life, fortune, sports illustrated. If there was a magazine, he was the publisher. He was older. He was really kind of stuffy, very serious, very business-like, the exact opposite of me. I was bubbly, effervescent, outgoing, social, spontaneous, but we stayed together until he passed. Well, even before I met my publisher husband, I was writing. I wrote various plays. There was one that got very high acclaim. It was called The Women. It was put on Broadway. And it was all about women and the situation that women find themselves in. It was witty, it was satirical, oh. I was so proud of this. I wrote eight other plays. Kiss the Boys Goodbye, Abide With Me. What was so interesting is what I wrote for Broadway and off-Broadway became screenplays and very successful screenplays. Love to write. Now I began doing stories and essays and books. 
But what I loved most, oh, I love to research and interview famous people from all over the world. I interview Gandhi and the Pope and Sean Kai-shek and his family and Winston Churchill. Oh my goodness, the presidents that I interviewed and was friendly with. I was friendly with Kennedy and Reagan and Nixon and Ford and Dwight D. Eisenhower. Oh, I learned so much from interviewing all of these famous people all over the world. Well, I became so involved in policy that I became an international journalist. I was involved in various treaties. I was even sent on the front line to be a war correspondent. My life was so exciting. I was involved in so many countries with so many situations. Well, here in Connecticut, where I was living, uh, the Republican Party said to me, you're a conservative, we want you in the United States Congress. Said, oh, I don't know what kind of a chance I have. There's never been a woman from Connecticut. No one from Connecticut, no. And there were 29 women who had ever been in Congress, and half of them got there their husband died or their father died. I had no connections. I won, it wasn't a landslide. I was a very persuasive speaker. I did a lot of research. I knew what I was talking about. Stayed in congressperson for two terms. I was on so many committees, anything doing with business and finance, anything having to do with negotiation and treaties and international circumstances. After two years, two terms, I said, whoa, you know, no one is here respected as a woman. All of the women in Congress felt the same way. We were token people. Yes, they listened to us, but not really. We were so superficial. We had to work three and four times harder than any man to get anything through. And I was just tired of the fight in Congress. Well, at that time, I was working and writing speeches for Dwight D. Eisenhower, and he said, we can't lose you, Claire. He offered me a job with the UN. He said, I want you to be my Secretary of Labor. I would have been the second Secretary of State at that time, one of the cabinet. Only Francis Perkins would have been ahead of me. I said, I don't know. I don't want to deal with men and unions. He said, I know, there's never been an ambassador of a major country. I want you to go to Italy. Oh my goodness, Italy, being a good Catholic, knowing the Pope, being in the center of everything that was going in Europe. I said, yes, this is the job for me. Well, of course, Italian men love women but not in a political sense. I won them over. I got a lot accomplished, but I became very, very ill when I was in Italy. I became so ill, they had to send me home and see if they could find out what was wrong with me. I had lead poisoning. The embassy was in an old villa painted with lead paint. Oh, it took me so long to get over the sickness. Well, by the time I became well again, there was someone else in Italy. And this time I became an ambassador to Brazil. Again, this meant learning a new language. I had to be able to speak Portuguese now. I was always up for the challenge and I was a quick learner. Well, this time I was in my 70s. And 
I said, you know, Claire, it's about time you did something for yourself. You love to write. I came home, I wrote my memoirs. I wrote books. I wrote essays. Oh, I began to paint. I love to paint. I was really a very good painter. I worked on my art collection. I built my chapel for my daughter, Anne, in Palo Alto, right near Stanford. And I had a lot of money. I had my husband's money. I had my money. I wanted to use it in the best way possible. I never had an education. I never went to college. I wanted to do scholarships for women, but I wanted to pinpoint something. Math, science, architecture, engineering, and technology. This was STEM. That's what STEM was all about today. I was so far ahead of the curve, wanting women to focus in these areas. So that's where my money went. It even went to places in Richfield, like the Richfield Historical Society. And today, you can still try for some of my women's scholarships. Well, I got a lot of accolades. I was on the cover of any of the famous magazines, not once, sometimes twice or three times. I got so many honorary degrees, you cannot believe it. Never went to college. I even got an honorary degree in law. I got the coveted Medal of Freedom. I got the first award from West Point, the Thayer Award. The Thayer Award had never, ever been given to a woman before for international excellence. The Dag Hammershield Award, oh, it just went on and on. Of course, I had a postage stamp. I also was in the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. I was in the National Hall of Fame. Oh, I couldn't have asked for any more accolades than I got. And people would say to me, you know, Claire, what do you consider yourself? Are you a feminist, a suffragette, an ERA person? Who are you? And I would say, I am my own person. Do not categorize me. I voted. I was not a suffragette, but I know what those women went through. Feminists, there's so many definitions. I don't know what the feminists are all about. ERA, some things I agree on, some things I don't. The only thing that I liked when people called me a Renaissance woman because I had a mission, I had a vision. I thought out of the box I was ahead of my time. So if anything, remember, Claire Booth Luce, Renaissance woman. Eleanor Roosevelt had a lot of quotes attributed to her. After her, I had a lot of quotes attributed to me, and you've probably heard of some. So I'm gonna end with just a couple of my quotes. Number one, there are no hopeless situations. There are only men who have grown hopeless about them. Number two, money can't buy happiness, but it can make you awfully comfortable while you're being miserable. Courage is the ladder on which all other virtuals mount. Number four, guns know no policy except destruction. And the last one, and I think you will probably believe in all five of these, if men had to bear babies 
there'd never be more than one child in a family. Well, thank you for tuning in, for listening to my story. Next week, we have another great story about a strong woman. We're going to be talking about the ladies of the street. The first street we're going to deal with is Sarah Bishop Road. This was a very different woman from the Revolutionary War period. She was Ridgefield's first and only hermitress. Thank you so much for tuning in.